The backhand clear is the shot I get asked to teach the most, usually by adult players. Although it's the most complex of all the shots in badminton, I'm confident that this video will give you a clear understanding of how to execute the backhand clear properly. I've tried to be as detailed as possible without being too complicated. I hope you enjoy it. Before I begin, just watch and observe. See what comes to your attention. I'll start the lesson in just a moment. There are three phases of the complete stroke, preload, load, and strike. Before I explain these in detail, let's first look at how you need to start. To figure out how to hold the racket for a standard backhand clear, hold the racket out in front of you so that the top part of the grip is resting on the inside of your thumb and the bottom is pressing up on the lower part of your pinky. The racket should be horizontal with the strings facing down. Don't only use the flat side of your thumb as I'm doing here. This is only useful when the shuttle is right next to you. You're practicing this stroke for when the shuttle is actually behind you, which is a more realistic situation. Again, don't use this surface of your thumb only. Use more of the side of your thumb. Now, hold the racket out in front of you and point your thumb towards the head of your racket and very importantly, cock your wrist by bending it at a 90 degree angle. I call this wrist position the hitchhiker's wrist. Cocking the wrist maximizes force production by locking the wrist and allowing energy to flow smoothly and uninterrupted from your shoulder, elbow and wrist to the shuttle. It makes the forearm and the hand one unit rather than having a gap in between where the force you produce could leak out. The hitchhiker's wrist keeps the racket perfectly vertical at the point of contact, allowing it to move like a catapult. If you can get yourself close enough to the shuttle, the hitchhiker's wrist allows you to use the wrist in the correct way in order to produce maximum force. I'll explain this in just a second. Placing the thumb correctly on the handle and the wrist in the hitchhiker's position is huge. Make sure you get this right. Take a look at how my hand is making slight adjustments as the contact point moves from being right next to me to well behind me. I'm shifting my thumb towards the side of the racket as the contact point moves further and further behind in order to keep the racket head square at the moment of impact. You don't want to slice the shuttle, so it has to be struck perfectly square in the middle of the strings in order to produce the most force. Plus, you're hitting a straight clear, so any slice will alter the flight path of the shuttle. The further the shuttle is behind you, the more your thumb position moves towards the side of the handle and the more you'll need to use the side edge of your thumb. If you notice that the shape of the handle of your racket is an octagon, it has 8 sides. It's not perfectly round. This is to provide an edge for your fingers, including your thumb, so that you can press up against it to produce force. Otherwise, your fingers would slip and you'd lose all control over the racket head. Although you can generate a lot of force with your thumb on the side of the racket and using the side edge of your thumb, it's not ideal, so try to contact the shuttle as soon as possible. A floppy wrist with the thumb pointing away from the head of the racket like this will generate very little force. The energy traveling from your body to the racket will find its way to the bend in the wrist joint and escape through it, leaving very little energy to transfer to the racket. Preload phase is exactly as the name implies, pre-load. It's the stage before you apply force to your racket and thus, it's also the part of the stroke in which there should be minimal to no tension from your waist up, especially in the shoulder, elbow and fingers. The wrist is the only joint that's locked throughout the stroke. Being the last joint in the series of force producing joints, it needs to be secure. It needs to form a tight bridge between the forearm and the hand in order for energy to transfer from your arm to your racket. In the preload phase, hold the racket exactly as I described at the beginning, with the thumb up and the wrist in hitchhiker's position. Bring your elbow very close to your hip and bend it so it makes a 90 degree angle. This makes the arm structure stable, giving it potential to produce force. 
Before I continue, you need to know the correct terminology for the two different wrist positions used in the backhand clear. When the palm of your hand faces upward, your wrist is supinated. When your palm faces downward, your wrist is pronated. Now, flip your racket over by supinating the wrist so that the palm of your hand is facing upwards. The racket head should be flat and pointing to your right if you're right-handed and to your left if you're left-handed. If you are a wheelchair user, this exact technique applies to you with one exception. Because your wheelchair may get in the way of the stroke, start the preload phase higher in your body like say at your chest height. The rest of what I'm going to describe should work with perhaps slight adjustments. I'll be making a series of videos specific to wheelchair users. The preload phase starts like this. Bring the bottom of your racket towards your opposite shoulder whilst maintaining the hitchhiker's wrist. Notice that my elbow is crossing in front of my chest somewhere towards my sternum. Once your racket reaches the opposite shoulder, it marks the end of the preload phase. Just a couple of points. The time it takes for the bottom of the racket to reach your opposite shoulder depends on how much time you have. If you have more time, take longer to get it to your shoulder. If you have less time, get it to your shoulder quickly. The challenge will be to determine the correct speed of the preload phase. Try not to get to the opposite shoulder too early or too late. Too early will decrease momentum and too late will disrupt the flow of the stroke and rush the following load phase. Now let's look at the load phase. Firstly, load refers to the act of flipping the racket over by pronating the wrist, thereby throwing the racket's weight onto your thumb. And secondly, load refers to the generation of force by correctly timing the order of the body's movement so that maximum energy is produced at the point of contact. So once your racket reaches your opposite shoulder, flip your racket by pronating the wrist. Point your elbow towards the shuttle and extend it. As your elbow is straightening out, supinate the wrist quickly towards the shuttle. The moment before impact marks the end of the load phase. Just a couple of points. Most people lose the technique when they pronate their wrist because they find it challenging to maintain hitchhiker's wrist. Do not lose hitchhiker's wrist. And make sure that as you supinate the wrist to strike the shuttle, you really feel the weight of your racket resting on your thumb because you'll produce way more power this way. The moment of impact and the follow through afterwards are both part of the strike phase. Just as you strike the shuttle, tense up and lock all the joints in your body so that the energy produced from the impact doesn't escape through any loose joint. Feeling the impact will be necessary to get the maximum power out of your effort. After you strike the shuttle, allow the arm to continue opening up, feeling a stretch in the shoulder and chest. Allow your arm to come to rest by your side after the follow through as if nothing happened. Let's look at the whole stroke with all three of its phases. See how the stroke is making a figure eight in the air in front of me, always leading with the elbow. This is the shape of the stroke, so try to draw this shape out in front of you with your racket. Practice in front of a mirror. This helps a lot. Power depends on alternating between being relaxed to being extremely tense to being relaxed again. The difference in muscle tension before and at impact is what determines the acceleration of the swing and the force produced upon impact. To find the right moment to speed up your racket, go slow and feel the weight. This is so important. This will help you feel the weight of the shuttle against the strings at impact, which will help generate huge force production. Release all the tension after impact in the follow through. Although the impact has already come and gone, the follow through is crucial to force production. If you're tight in the follow through, the shuttle will remain on the strings longer and the force of impact will be absorbed by the racket. Muscle tightness in the follow through also means that you're tight throughout the whole swing. It's a sign of anxiousness or apprehension. Development of the skill through practice will help eliminate anxiety. Being relaxed and patient is key. In this clip, you can see how the preload phase and the load phase stay exactly the same regardless of whether I'm contacting the shuttle high or low. In other words, my wrist is cocked, my thumb is up, and I'm making a figure eight leading with my elbow. All you need to do is adjust where on the handle to place the thumb, the speed of the preload phase, and where to point your elbow, all of which are determined by how much pressure you're under. Before looking at the footwork, you need to know the terminology referring to your feet. 
The racket foot is the foot on the same side as you hold your racket. The other foot is your non-racket foot. Start low by bending the knees. Do a little shuffle step towards the back of the court. As you do the shuffle, before your non-racket foot touches the ground, turn it so that it points into the back corner. Then lunge and plant your racket foot. That's it. So just a few points. The shuffle may look small and insignificant, but even if it's only getting you closer by an inch, it makes a big difference in the quality of the shot. That inch could be the difference between being in perfect position and hitting the perfect shot and improving your chances of winning the rally, versus being in a less than perfect position and making the outcome of the rally more unpredictable. Also, make sure you plant your racket foot on the ground just as you strike the shuttle. This is very important because your body needs to be grounded and stable before producing the kind of force required in a full length clear. Plus, planting your foot prior to contact stops your movement, stabilizing your body and making your shot more accurate. From this angle, notice how my back is facing the net. I've turned 180 degrees. Remember, you're really developing the shot for the most extreme situation when the shuttle is behind you. There's no point in developing the shot only for when it's right next to you. People ask me to teach them this shot because they just don't have the technique to hit it when they're struggling. When it's next to you, you can get away with hitting a decent shot just by using brute strength. But reliance on strength comes at a cost of using excessive energy and possibly injuring your wrist and your elbow. At first, of course you would practice this shot with the shuttle next to you, but gradually you'll want to put yourself in a more compromised position so that you can get yourself out of real trouble. That's what this technique is designed for. Here are some great exercises to practice the technique without a shuttle. Remember I said in the beginning that if you can't execute the stroke without a shuttle, you'll definitely not be able to do it with a shuttle? Use a mirror in conjunction with this video and practice alongside me. Practicing the stroke without a shuttle eliminates the pressure and stress of hitting the shuttle perfectly. Don't use up precious court time to practice with a shuttle until you've developed positive muscle memory and you're confident that the stroke is feeling natural. So the idea is to develop muscle memory so that when it comes time to practicing with a shuttle, the arm moves automatically. At this point, all you need to focus on is timing and contact quality. Pronating and supinating your wrist without a racket is excellent for developing the correct wrist action. Pretend that you're turning a doorknob very quickly over and over again like this. It should be a sudden snap action so that acceleration is maximal. Then practice the same action with your racket with your wrist in hitchhiker's position. This will add load to your wrist and shoulder and help to strengthen the arm and wrist. It will also give you a chance to feel the weight of the racket and find the moment when you should start accelerating the swing. When you practice with a shuttle, do not, and I emphasize, do not try to hit the shuttle hard. See how much power is produced with the most minimal effort and how far the shuttle will travel just by using the right technique. Most people I teach tend to want to hit the shuttle hard right away before they've learned the right movement and feel. Using muscle to produce force should be the icing on the cake so to speak. It should just add that little bit extra you need to get the shuttle to the very back. I suggest that in the beginning stages of learning the stroke, eliminate the tightening part and just swing through the shuttle and observe how far the shuttle goes without adding your own force. Eventually, you can tighten up more and more and use more strength. Also, in the early stages of learning the stroke, make your swing bigger. It'll allow you to explore the full breadth of the stroke. As you develop the backhand clear, you'll notice that the figure 8 shape of the stroke will become smaller and more subtle, almost imperceptible to the outside viewer. This is when you know you've got it. Be relaxed, have patience, and take your time to develop your balance correctly. So that's it. I hope you enjoyed my first video. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comment section below. If you like this video and want to learn more, please subscribe to my channel. Thank you for watching.